at a mission at Mona Mona in North Queensland, Australia. A young man named Rob, who had been serving as the mission's real name, it's his real name, yes. as also the mission's chief assistant, was in full bloom of health, but fell suddenly and mysteriously ill. <gasps> yeah. The doctor, S.M. Lambert of the Western Pacific Health Service, was called for. Right. The white missionary, baffled by his helper's unexplainable distress, begged the doctor to examine him. Dr. Lambert made a thorough check. He found no fever. Uh, Rob complained of no particular pains. And in fact, there were no evident signs of disease whatsoever, except for the fact that Rob appeared very weak and seriously ill. The mission was located in a culturally divided part of North Queensland, with converts to the Christian mission making up a sizable community, living alongside a similarly significant group of non-convert aboriginals. Among these aboriginals holding to their native traditions was a very famous shaman or medicine man. Another, another way we could speak of a shaman. Man of medicine. Mm. <laughs> not, like a, not like a doctor, though. A different kind of medicine. Anywho. <laughs> His name was Nebo. Ne Nebo. Ooh, can we Nebo. just call him that? Sure. Like, me. We'll call him way Nebo. better than medicine It's man. like Nido, but Finding with a B. Nebo. Sorry, Nebo. Rob to <laughs> told the missionary that he had been boned. I hate oh. when that happens. What? I had a dime. That is to say, <laughs> Nebo had pointed a bone at him, and Rob was convinced that this would bring about his very imminent demise. What type of bone? A, 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 I, the, the record does not indicate the variety mm. of bone that we're referring to. Mm. Uh, that that's like a, like a, are you, it's a, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the doctor and the missionary, taking Rob's claim seriously, went to Nebo and threatened him. If he did not go with them to see Rob, they would cut off the food the mission was providing to the tribe and drive his people away from their land. Nebo agreed to go with them. Leaning over Rob's sickbed, the shaman told the young convert that the boning had all been a mistake. Again, this is all <laughs> It was only a joke. In truth, he had never pointed any bone at him in the first place. That's what they all say. Yeah. He said it was a joke? Did yeah, he really? Just kidding. I was just oh, kidding when I cursed you to die. Well, that's death prank, curse. Bro. <laughs> Rob's recovery was almost instantaneous. That very evening, he was back at work, happy and strong as ever. Hmm. Australian Aboriginal boning is a form of the evil eye. Sorry. You can't get over that, can you? No. A way of cursing <laughs> someone uh, in a way that causes the victim's quick and inevitable demise. That is, unless supernatural means are invoked to stem the flow of life out of the unfortunate victim's body. The evil eye is the mother of all curses, and it's the first subject in our fourth series here on Occult Confessions. We are going to devote the next eight episodes to discussing black magic through the ages. From Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> from curses to human sacrifice, to dark, magical, murder cult conspiracies. So I have a question. If it's, like, they refer to it as the evil eye when you bone someone, wouldn't it be like the evil bone? Where does the eye come from? <laughs> we'll be spending time <laughs> with the wickedest man I'm in the saying, world. There's a flaw. Alistair Crowley, or Crowley, depending on your preference and uncover the occult beliefs of Hitler's Nazi party, who made ritual and symbolism such a central part of their rise to power, and finally, visit the satanic panic of the 1980s. Sounds like a band. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. My name <laughs> is Rob C. Thompson. I am a doctor of paranormal culture and occult history and philosophy. I am also the supreme hierophant of the secret order of alchemical actors who are gathered around me here today for our uh, twice a month podcast adventures bringing true stories of the supernatural to life to share with our listeners. Our little cult is led by Grand Master Olivia Litterall. Say hello, Olivia. Hi, I'm Olivia. <laughs> cool, We're st this is still a podcast. Uh, today, <laughs> we've got uh, Shannon Landers. Hello. Our, our, our wild card, if you will, asking bone-related <laughs> questions. 
Uh, like karate is Jacob wild. Wheatley. What's up? Okay. Uh, and Savannah Verrett. Hello. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> uh, they'll be joining our discussions, and uh, we've got plenty more of our actors acting out tales of the ancient curse of the evil eye. This, my friends, is Occult Confessions. Ooh. <laughs> Shall we join hands? Oh my gosh. Oh, are we going to chant? I think we're going to chant. Be... Oh, what is oh. this? We're just what is it? What are we doing? <laughs> doing it like this. Oh, okay. Ready? Oh, wait. No, no, no. It's, oh, it's just the. Guys. We, the, the members of the, of the secret, secret order of alchemical actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. We're I like, think this helped oh us. Oh no, we're like three <laughs> minutes in solid. and it's already getting weird. <laughs> we're getting really culty really fast. Yeah. I think that's slow for us. No. We want to start today's episode by thanking our new friends, Violet O'Shea, who left a very kind review on iTunes. We Aww. love you, Violet, in all I caps. Love she gave Violet us an all caps Shay. love. Wow. Aww. I love when they do that. You know well, her? I all caps love her back. Delightful. Yes. That's uh, sweet. Thank you for listening. Uh, also, Nicholas, who reached out on Facebook. Cheers, Nick. We had a nice little exchange on Ooh, Facebook. Yes. Uh, we want to encourage all of our listeners to consider reviewing us. We, are, we live on stars, also money. Visit our <laughs> Patreon. Mostly money. <laughs> We're starving. <laughs> you can visit, <laughs> visit our uh, website at www.occultconfessions.com. Click on Donate, and for a dollar or two a month, you can keep this occult adventure confessing. Yeah. I think that's fair. It's a fair request. It is. Also, tell your friends about us. Please. Okay, so today, uh, one other note before we, we <laughs> get started. I know everyone's anxious to talk about the evil eye. Uh, we're recording today's episode uh, with our friends Ted and Bruce at QAC TV station, uh, the QAC TV station, Queen Anne's County Television Station, here <laughs> on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Uh, we usually record at the Cadby Theater at Chesapeake College in the middle of a cornfield, but today Ted and Bruce <laughs> have offered to post a video of our meeting up on the interwebs for you to enjoy. Yeah, we're like also in the middle of a cornfield, though. And yes, we are still in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> Slightly to the left, though. Yeah. Like, it's left nice to be in a cornfield. building this time <laughs> instead of your, just out in a cornfield, you know? With your Patreon help, maybe we'll get out of the cornfield. Yeah, uh, so we'll be linking their we'll video our uh, on our Facebook page and, and anywhere else that we, we can like it. Uh, so go ahead and, and check that out if you like to see what we look like while we podcast. Ew. Yes. It's oh, wait, no. an attractive bunch. Do you oh, think they'll have our God. pictures up as like it's going on so they can just scroll through and see, hmm, that one's tough. Now, uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that we have listeners in Canada and Australia and uh, the UK. Uh, so a lot of podcasts come out of big cities, right? Like LA and New York and Seattle. Uh, but part of what makes us so very special is that we're recorded on Maryland's eastern shore, which is a part of Maryland that people in Maryland aren't even really confident is here. Uh, so to our Australian listeners, don't feel so bad. Um, we are on the Delmarva Peninsula, if you've got your map out, just south of Delaware. Anyway, yeah. uh, cool. let's get to the evil eye. <laughs> a little geography yeah, lesson for our international <laughs> listeners. Or even like our California listeners. I think it's fair. They should, they've been wondering, where are you? So they or can maybe even our Maryland listeners, honestly. Some, some of them might not know. I across the bridge. They don't even know that this half of Maryland exists. It's weird. We're going to situate the evil eye in the larger category of curses that kill. In order to do that, I need to do a little uh, freewheeling classification here because nobody has ever categorized curses that kill in any kind of scholarly way. So here I am. You're a scholar with a way. We've got two varieties of curses, in my opinion. The emic and the etic. E-M-I-C. Hmm. E-T-I-C. Yes. Do you see? <laughs> E-T? <laughs> etic. No, I don't. Is an anthropological term that means the outsider perspective. Etic with a T. The view from a distance, looking in and trying to make sense of things. Etic curses are ones that we perceive as a potential cause for the victim's demise, but that the victim, him or herself, was not aware of. So you're cursed. So you didn't know. Mm -hmm. Emic means the insider perspective. From a cultural standpoint, emic with an M is the viewpoint of a religion's believer or a tribe's native member. The evil eye is an emic curse because it operates at least in part on the victim's psyche. The victim is aware that he or she has been cursed and believes in the curse. And this is what kills him or her. Mm -hmm. So let's just identify a few famous etic curses in the modern world. 
so we can get a sense of what that's all about before we try and make sense of the evil eye and its emic curses. For that, we are going to go over to today's brief history uh, featuring a fan favorite, James Caplangis. <laughs> uh, and James, um, w welcome James, we welcome need back. to give Thank him you. a name, a title. Yeah, uh, so part of this uh, series, we're on the fourth series here, is we're gonna be giving titles to all of our uh, regular alchemical actors. Mm -hmm. So James, uh, since you are handling the brief history for us today, and it's the first brief history, we took off the brief history segment for all of our soul series, uh, we feel you deserve the first title. Well, I'm honored. Uh, so, so do we, I, have, we, we do, I do, as the supreme hierophant of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors, do hereby name, dub thee, James. That's my name. Captain. Captain, Captain of James. the table. Oh, Ta all right. The, captain, the captain's table. You are captain of the table, ironically. You are not currently at the table. Yeah, he's not. But that's why he's captain. It's because he's watching he's over overseeing the table. The table. Yes. He's, All right, let's get mm -hmm. to that brief history, James. I'm throwing it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for that beautiful title. Captain <laughs> Table. You're welcome. And now, a brief history of a few famous modern Etic curses that kill. Curse number one: Tecumseh and Tippecanoe, 1840 to 1960. Good years. Good years. My favorite. Tecumseh was a Shawnee chief who led an attempt to create an Indian confederacy west of the Ohio River. At the Battle of Tippecanoe, his band of warriors was defeated by American forces fighting under the command of William Henry Harrison. After joining with the British during the War of 1812, he was killed fighting in Ontario, and his body was mutilated and buried in a mass grave. Harrison won the presidency in 1840 and died of pneumonia while in office. Every president elected on a 20-year cycle was then assassinated or died in office. Abraham Lincoln, elected in 1860, was assassinated no, by John hey. Wilkes Booth. Really? We, we all know this. He's one of my favorite presidents. I had no idea. Wow. James Garfield, elected in 1880, was assassinated by Charles Guiteau. Yeah, nobody liked him. Mm. I mean, Charles. Is that true? Also Garfield. William <laughs> McKinley. He eats all that yeah. lasagna. <laughs> anyway, go, go ahead, James. Sorry. <laughs> William McKinley, elected in 1900, was assassinated by Leon Sholgosh. Mm. Warren G. Harding, elected in 1920, died of a heart attack. Franklin Roosevelt, elected in 1940, died of a cerebral hemorrhage. And finally, John mm. F. Kennedy, elected in 1960, was shot in Dallas by Lee Harvey Oswald. <gasps> Curse number two. Curse number two. Tutankhamun's tomb, Cairo, that's in Egypt. Yes. Wow. 1922 to 1924. Also Howard. Reasonable years, not the best. Not the best. <laughs> but they're, they're decent as far as years go. Cairo. Cairo. <laughs> Howard Carter led the excavation of the tomb of Tutankhamun, funded by George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. While Carter himself didn't suffer any ill effects from the curse, except that his canary was devoured by a cobra. <gasps> what? That's, a pretty that's Ill not effect. like a severe effect. That seems just like that's pretty traumatic. It's pretty his close sure. to the yeah. event too. Yeah. His yeah. backer, Carnarvon, died of complications from pneumonia following a mosquito bite after he arrived in Cairo in April 1923. Mosquitoes mm. are deadly creatures. Sure they are, that's and they're I'm sneaky. I'm so upset about that. It was like the 30s. Go ahead. Oh, so, they had so a net. <laughs> On top of that, the lights were supposed to have gone out across the city at that moment, and back in England, his dog dropped dead. <gasps> now that is first the that canary, and now the, the dog. dog's name. These are innocent animals. They had Properly nothing to do with this tomb. I hear you, Rob. <laughs> George J. Gould, the first son of famous American robber baron J. Gould developed a fever after visiting the tomb and died on the French Riviera in May 1923. Archibald Douglas Reed, who x-rayed Tutankhamun's mummy, died of a mysterious illness in 1924. Aren't you related to him, Jacob? I cannot disclose that information. But that's why we Listen, you. I'm looking out for yeah, you Yeah, it's the all. only reason you were invited to be on this Wait, episode. You told us Listen, in your resume. We're talking about curses right now. I don't want this to affect oh, you. Oh, I understand. I understand. I'm trying to look oh. out for you. Go ahead, James. You're welcome. And A.C. Mace, who assisted on Carter's excavation team, 
died of arsenic poisoning in 1928. It may be that the tomb cursed anyone who dared breach it, but what to make of Carter's immunity? Or that of the many other people involved in the excavation? Fishy stuff. Very fishy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Curse number three. Ooh. The Ooh. Poltergeist Trilogy. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, now it's gonna get real. Ooh. 1982 to 1988. Those are the best years. The worst years. I, hmm. on, I, yes. I, who Four is? actors involved in the making of the Poltergeist series in the 1980s died during the course of the film's production and release. Really? I've the worst never heard years. Of that. Oh, girl. The worst Olivia years. will tell you about it, or you could listen to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> According to Jo Beth Williams, who played Diane Freeling, the production team used real skeletons, filming a scene in which her character confronts the bodies buried under the house. The legend is that the spirits of these remains exacted revenge for their exploitation. Two of the four were relatively natural deaths. Julian Beck, better known to theater students as one of the most productive and avant-garde theater artists of the 20th centuries, who founded the hippie caravanning Living Theater along with Judith Molina. Yeah, props for props for my man. I mean, yes. he died because R. of the poltergeist. No, Judith didn't die. Oh, he di okay. Julian Beck died. Sorry. Julian Beck, and he died of stomach cancer in 1985, just months before the release of Poltergeist 2, in which he played the evil spirit, Kane. In 1987, the Native American actor, Will Sampson, who also appeared in Poltergeist 2, died after receiving a heart and lung transplant. It's more natural death, I think. Not as mysterious. Both of them are pretty natural, actually. Yeah. Just through complications. Yeah, yeah. The two more mysterious deaths happened to the actors playing the female children of the fictional Freeling family. The first Poltergeist was released in June. In November, Dominique Dunn, who played the big sister Donna Freeling, was choked into a coma by her boyfriend, John Sweeney, who was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and only served just under four years for the crime. Hmm. Heather O'Rourke, who, who started the series when she was six, died of septic shock caused by a bowel obstruction at the age of 12 during the filming of the third Poltergeist. So the little girl that says, they're here, that one? To that girl? I think it's that girl. Is it the same one? Pretty, pretty much. Right, and that's the brief history <laughs> of modern <laughs> edit curses that kill. Oh, it's oh, nice. yeah. Yay! Beautiful. That was delightful, Captain James. Yes, yeah, Captain of the, the table. table. James, table Captain. Captain. That you're not at the table. Cap James. <clears throat> These are etic curses because the people affected did not know that they were being cursed. And in the case of the presidential assassinations or Dominique Dunn's killing, their knowledge had nothing to do with the death itself. Demise came from outside of themselves. Commentators looking back on the events surrounding presidential assassinations or the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb or the filming of Poltergeist have determined that there is an unfortunate coincidence surrounding the victims. While the coincidences are bizarre and tempt us to try and create an explanation, disgruntled enemies or real human skeletons, there's no way to know if there's any causal connection between a curse and these events. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Good. Yes. <laughs> so glad I invited you guys to podcast with me. For nice. your hype men, Ron. Nice. You get it. Emic curses with an M are another story. In the genre of curses that kill, the emic variety are responsible for a unique psychophysical phenomenon. Ooh. Called Hexdeath. <laughs> Ooh. I like that long dramatic pause, Hexdeath. It is. Because I had to turn the page. <laughs> the victim of Emic Curse both knows that she has been cursed and believes sincerely in the reality of the curse. The victim shares a cultural framework with her supernatural assailant. And, barring any indication that the curse has been lifted, it almost always results in the victim's death. In Europe, evil eye traditions are associated with reproduction. Here it might get a little blue for Queen Anne's County TV, let's see. Uh, the evil eye is often given unintentionally by an older single woman who is unaware that the power to, of her power to bestow the curse. What Italians call the gettatore. No. Any Italians? Mm. Anybody? Okay. 
Well, no. then I'm pronouncing that exactly right. <laughs> uh, yes. Can't argue yes. with you. Jetatore, um, and it, this is the the ability to bestow the curse is actually passed through the family line. The curse generally falls on babies, children, pregnant women, and young brides. Wait, and this is an Italian woman thing. Italian woman. Italian women can do this. What are Brie and I's chances if we're part Italian? <laughs> Let me talk about your mother's milk. Nice. <laughs> uh, your mother's milk-filled breasts could dry up Don't if you are cursed by the Jedi. Not your. <laughs> your it could be any, anyone could be Annette a mother. could be watching. Or a baby might suddenly give up eating and become fussy and colicky after an encounter with such a woman. Yeah. Such a woman. <laughs> These ailments can then be remedied by the intervention of an elder familiar with diagnosing and treating what the Italians call malocchio, the evil eye. These, uh, this lines up pretty closely with witch traditions going back to the late medieval period and is distinctly... European. The power of unwed women to work evil magic on the reproduction of humans and other species was a fantasy, but a well-documented one in books like the Malleus Maleficarum. We did an episode on this a while back. Extending the sexual connotations of the eye, Alan Berger, a scholar, talks about wetness being a way to ward the eye off, because the eye itself is a drying up of the reproductive organs. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying to lure you all into this. I need to digest you. Yes, are, this is you are holding back. <laughs> simmer for a bit. You might make a cross in spit on the forehead of a cursed baby, for example. Oh, I was going to try it on Shannon. I mean, I'm not that old. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> You're not a baby. Hang though. on a second. Like, um, I need a clarification. So, <laughs> the evil eye. The person giving the evil eye is all dried up, or <laughs> they are they, are, they are drying up they dry the other up people. Others. Okay, yeah. so they, they curse the, the person, yeah. and the cursed person dries. Do Correct. they take their yeah. moisture? Like your milk, you, like, you get up get milkless. This? Like they you're trying to on you and just like yeah, you're do trying they to get feed it, your though? baby, and you get you cursed, and then you're milkless. And someone steals my milk. But if we spit on your forehead, then you'd be good to go because we wet you with magic. <laughs> what a simple solution. Hmm. Just let me spit on you. Okay, so just once, and I'm good. Uh, are we understanding this? Yes, I okay, understand good. perfectly now. <laughs> Often, <laughs> the accusation or suspicion of the evil eye happens after the event, though. Um, oh. and, and it's with things that are in and themselves kind of delicate. Like, milk production can be delicate. Modern women who are not afraid of the jetatore can still have trouble <laughs> with breastfeeding. There's, so like, support groups and stuff. Have Olivia just spit on me just in case it ever happens I to me. I think it's I'm worth... Good. Yeah, just in case. Yes. I'll okay. spit on everyone. So I don't Thank need to be cursed for us. She can do... Okay. Nice. Uh, babies are fragile in utero and out of the utero, and uh, sex true. is complicated, man. Hmm. It is. That's so awesome. I, I think it's handy for us to just to be like, oh yeah, I've been cursed. That's why I'm having some trouble with any of these things. That's That's a I've heard that many times. <laughs> like, it's not working out. <laughs> it's sort of got uh, the cart and the flaccid horse reversed. So you got to put them the other way around. I love that. I've never well, heard of that the saying car, before. The car the, anyway. Yep. Let's, My grandma told me that one all the time. <laughs> let's look at a case that gets the order the white, right way around, with the cart going behind the horse. Yeah, right. Okay. In his book, okay. <laughs> Symptoms of Unknown Origin, Clifton Meter reports on an episode at a segregated all-black hospital in the South in 1938, where a 60-year-old African-American man, Meter calls him Vanders, checked in for treatment. Vanders had lost 50 pounds and was wasting away. The doctor on call, a Dr. Drayton Doherty, suspected that it was either tuberculosis or cancer, but through a thorough analysis revealed signs of neither. The man wouldn't eat and couldn't hold down food given through a tube. He got closer and closer to death and finally, his wife asked Dr. Doherty if she could take him aside for a private conversation. It appears the man had run afoul of a voodoo priest after the priest, who we'll call Tremont, had summoned the man to the cemetery to perform some sort of ritual. There was an argument, and the priest waved a bottle at Vanders, cursing him and swearing that he would die soon, no matter what any medical doctor tried to do to save him. He quit eating that very night. His wife had kept the story a secret for fear that the priest would curse her and her children as well. Dr. Doherty summoned all of the man's family together and told them a story. Brandon? I know exactly what's wrong with your husband. Suspecting you'd run afoul of one of the voodoo doctors known to practice in these parts, I arranged to meet the priest, your Mr. Tremont, last night in the pretense of selling some hens my wife raises in our yard. 
I told him I knew what he'd done to you and I wanted to know from his own lips what he'd done. Of course, he refused, so I grabbed him by the collar and held him against a tree until he confessed. That voodoo priest rubbed some lizard eggs into your stomach and they climbed down into your real stomach and hatched out some small lizards. All but one of them died, leaving one large one, which is eating up all your food and the lining of your body. I will now get that lizard out of your system and cure you of this horrible curse. The doctor... In your stomach. You can't expect the... him to say lizard inside of you without me bringing up reptilians. You know oh. that, like, right? You so you're saying... basically just asked for me to talk about So reptilians. Are you telling me that the reptilian conspiracy has to do with people eating their eggs? Who said it doesn't? I... See, I'm she normally on the reptilian hype train, but I, I think you're wrong on this one. <laughs> How am I wrong, though, Savannah? I, I think you're focusing on the wrong things here. Yes, go ahead. It was eating the Focus lining? the conversation What lizard in his stomach? There's a lizard in his stomach. So reptilian curse. eating all the food. And the lining. And, and, the, and he's eating his stomach like inside his stomach. out. Let me make you How feel better I? about this. The doctor gave Vanders... I don't Vanders... think there's a way to feel better about this lizard thing, Rob. No. <laughs> no right. How, How do you Move help this? That. The doctor gave the man a shot to induce vomiting. Anti-lizard and... medication. <laughs> <laughs> and he snuck a lizard into the basin when Vanders was too busy retching to see what was happening. So the lizard wasn't really in there, Shannon. But then he, he put a lizard in there. Well, he snuck it into the basin, so it looked like he'd vomited up a lizard. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. That's he showed, lizard. for those of you who watch QAC TV while eating dinner, uh, <laughs> he showed the lizard to Vanders and announced that he had been cured. Right? Right. So he, like, folded. it. So, so I he, just he had, was a clever doctor. I just had the thought, like, point. wow, I can't believe I, he believed it, but then I just full-heartedly <laughs> believed it, like, just a couple <laughs> so, seconds ago. You, you were <laughs> on, see? So the doctor it was a very persuasive man, even when Brandon played so him just now. He came up with this <laughs> lizard on. story yes. all on his own. Right. With the other plans. He made it up. There weren't actual lizards. There were no there. lizard eggs. There were no lizards huh. involved in the Buddha ceremony. Has he used this before? How yeah, many how, people had lizards? Just this one guy. It's the one guy deal. You only get to do this once in your doctoring career. <laughs> this isn't a running scam. No, you can't okay. do this every time someone's sick. If Doherty hadn't been so creative, though, Mr. Vanders would have very likely died of the voodoo doctor's curse. Vanders believed in the culture and power of voodoo, and he knew that he had been cursed. This precipitated a psychophysical response that very nearly killed him. <laughs> Doherty was clever enough to know that Vanders was suffering, and the suffering had been brought on by voodoo, his voodoo belief, and that nothing standard medicine could do would help him. Only voodoo could answer voodoo. Mm -hmm. Fake voodoo. Doc yeah. Doctor invented voodoo. Mm -hmm. Another fascinating voodoo death involves a young woman who ran into a Baltimore hospital, bringing it on home to Maryland. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. She was hysterical oh. three days before her 23rd birthday. Let's hear from the nurse and the girl. Please, you've got to help me. Please, somebody! Sit down here. I'm gonna die! I'm gonna die! Take some deep breaths for me. Are you injured? Can you tell me if you're feeling any pain? Yes! No! I don't know. You've got to believe me! I've been cursed! Cursed? What do you mean? A midwife. As a voodoo practitioner of some kind, although voodoo itself was unlikely given the geography of the story, this midwife had delivered the girl, as well as two others, on a Friday the 13th in Georgia's Okifinoki Swamp. The Okifinoki? Okay. Wait, what? Okifinoki Swamp. Oh, Where are now. swamps in Baltimore? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm confused. I lost she something. was born in Georgia. Okay. I'm you so know, sorry. The Baltimore Oscar. Swamp. That was right that. <laughs> that People in Canada yeah. now think that we have swamps in Maryland. <laughs> We don't have swamps, in, there are no Baltimore swamps, but we do have swamps in Maryland. Yeah. Anyway, wetlands. We call them wetlands. Yeah, we live yeah, that's different. That's different. Anyway. Uh, she either cursed or predicted the deaths of all three girls. The first wouldn't live to be 16. She died in a car accident at the age of 15. The second wouldn't live to be 21. She was shot in a nightclub the night before her 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And this girl, you probably have guessed by now, would not live to see 23. But no unfortunate accident befell our third victim. They admitted the girl for observation into the Baltimore hospital, 
And the next day she was found dead in her hospital bed. Bed. Dead. 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 dead in her hospital bed. Oh. Cause of death unknown. Wow. I don't want us to get the wrong impression from these stories. Hex death is not limited to aboriginal tribes or the dark depths of southern swamps. Or Maryland swamps. People <laughs> yeah. have no connection to a tradition who people who have no connection to a tradition of hex death can suffer the exact same fate. Dr. James Mathis gave a case report of a man, Mr. X, who was going in and out of hospitals with severe epileptic and asthmatic fits. That was a pseudonym. I don't think his real name was. Yeah, I got excited. But They're pretty cool kinda, though. It's just Mr. Yeah. X. After treatment, this man would feel better, and then they'd send him home to his mother's house, where his condition would rapidly decline again. He was first admitted in January of 1960. He was dead by August with bronchial tubes full of mucus. Oh. What is a bronchial tube? I am <laughs> not like. They're like in your lungs, they like. Like if you have bronchitis? Oh. That's like your. It's your tubes. Okay. It's them tubes. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, he was 53 years old. Tubes shouldn't be filled with mucus. No, they shouldn't. They should not be filled. Traditionally, I don't think Not traditionally, no. That's, that's highly <laughs> unorthodox. <laughs> yeah. How dare they? <laughs> Unheard of, but... It's... The man had only gotten as far as the eighth grade because he had to look after his younger, mentally handicapped brother. Aww. Mom? With your brother away at college and your father, God rest his soul, six feet underground, you have to be the man of the house from now on. Do you understand? There won't be any more time for dawdling in the schoolhouse. Book learning is for little boys who've got no responsibilities, like your older brother. You've got to help me look after the little one. You know he can't help himself, and you can see how busy I am with all the housework. He had a very domineering mother who Mr. X believed was more or less infallible, and who had correctly predicted the end of both of his marriages before he turned 31. There's no two ways about it, son. That girl is a tramp. If she isn't pointing her he heels at the ceiling in the back of the laundry mat, she's on the porch trying to coax the milkman to deliver direct to her door. His mother helped him run a successful nightclub before and during World War II. Uh, and she ran the club by herself when he was away fighting in 1938. After the war, yeah, yeah, this man had quite a life, I feel like. He was an interesting his guy. Mother, yeah. Yeah. And his mother as well. Fun mother-son bonding. Right, running, running a nightclub. Night yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thought about the milkman, though, or his wife mess around with the milkman. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Having the we're milk trying to focus on the positive. Her the <laughs> <last something>. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to focus on the positive. You ruined it. <laughs> yeah, wait, Debbie we'll Downer. Just, I know. Uh, can't forget about this milkman. Think of the nightclubs. <laughs> Right. After the war, everything. he married a teacher 10 years younger than him. So nice. Makes you feel better? All right. Nice. Uh, and they had a son, <laughs> and they continued to run the club. But then in November 1959, someone made an offer to purchase the business. Hmm. The man stood to make a nice profit, Mr. X. But his mother, Mother X, did not want to part with the club. And after he accepted the offer, she was not pleased. She cursed him. Do this, son, and something dire will happen to you. Mark my words, something will strike you, strike you down right where you stand. She's brutal. Called I'm it. glad she's not my mom. <laughs> yeah, wow. you called it. She did curse him. Yeah. Yeah. Did you read ahead? I didn't know you could curse your children. No, you I just guess. Anyone. I you just can, had. There's no limits on who you can curse. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, don't, no. <laughs> no? I'm not going to spit on you. Is that you curse not the point of this podcast? Right, to learn how to curse people? We don't want to curse, we want to uncurse. We're here to help uncurse. I'm in the wrong room then. <laughs> Days later, Mr. X began coughing and wheezing, having not suffered so much as a head cold in 10 years. On January 2nd, the sale was complete on the club, and two days later, he was rushed to the emergency room. The day he died, he was on the phone with his mother telling her about a new business he was about to invest in and that he wouldn't be needing her help on this next adventure. <laughs> All she did was remind him of the dire consequences he was bound to suffer from the sale of the club. He was dead within an hour. What? That is so that rude. Is no <laughs> we'll let Dr. Mathis uh, give some meaning to this account, Mr. X's doctor. 
psychological death, whether by the weird incantations of a primitive shaman or by the malevolent wish of a thwarted mother, is a difficult thing for a scientifically trained physician to accept. Whatever name is given, it seems evident that such things may occur in a more complex, although less dramatic form in our modern civilization. The influence of the mother's death wish in this case can be regarded at least as a triggering mechanism for the asthmatic attacks. Walter B. Cannon, writing for the American Anthropologist in 1942, was one of the first to theorize hex death, which he called rather misleadingly voodoo death following pop cultural legends of Afro-Caribbean curses. Yeah, it's a little racist. A little racist. <sighs> After observing a series of unexplained deaths in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Brazil, Polynesia, British Guyana, and Haiti, Guyana, not Guinea. <laughs> not, <laughs> not New Guinea, Shannon. Guinea he compared, pigs. What? I'm yes, just saying. There's no guinea pigs involved. No guinea pigs. Next episode. Nope. He compared the cases of death by curse, like the case of young Rob, who we opened the episode with, to that of soldiers who died of shock during World War I. This is fascinating. He cited the experience of a surgeon named Wallace. Wallace described the case. That, um, wait. The suspense. Oh, Pause no. for dramatic effect. I got it. It's good. Oh. It's only one page away. Okay. He's gonna. He's gonna I got it. really worried there, there for a second. Page turn. He described. What was I talking about? World War One. Yes. Soldiers Guinea in pigs. World War One. And you said this I is really fascinating. And then he stopped. And huh. the correlation between them and corgis. In World War I. In World War I. We haven't discussed Little this yet, corgis. Rob. The Battle of... Anyway, I don't... We could uh, we could go there, Shannon. We, Patreon. Let's. Patreon. Yes. You're going to... For our Patreon. <laughs> Listeners at home. <laughs> we'll go there corgis on Patreon. We're going. And guinea pigs are connected and I will prove it. Patreon. <laughs> Our apologies to listeners who are just tuning into this as their very first experience with us. Huh. My condolences. Also, pretty much everyone. Anyone who's listening, watching, any, or our apologies to everyone. Yeah, why do you listen People to aren't this? even watching this, we're sorry. <laughs> we apologize. For the Corgi content. <laughs> two soldiers, the, the surgeon Wallace, World War I. Wallace, surgeon, World War I, two soldiers. One was buried when a shell exploded near him. The other, when he lit a fire over an unexploded shell, igniting it. Both men had only superficial injuries, so the shells exploded near them, they were buried, or they accidentally caused one to go off, but they didn't die, they were fine. Mm. But the terror of the experience pitched them into shock, and it's the shock that ultimately killed both men. So there was nothing physically wrong mm. with them. They were scared to death. Wow. That sort of echoes back to our girl in the Baltimore hospital, and Rob, and Mr. Vanders, and Mr. X. Let's hear from Cannon, the anthropologist. The question which now arises is whether an ominous and persistent state of fear can end the life of a man. Fear, as is well known, is one of the most deeply rooted and dominant of the emotions. Often, only with difficulty can it be eradicated. Associated with it are profound physiological disturbances widespread throughout the organism. Colin Andrew Ross, drawing on the work of Rupert Sheldrake, argued in the journal Anthropology of Consciousness that there's actually a physical basis to the evil eye. This is wild stuff. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about Sheldrake, just briefly. Rupert Sheldrake demonstrated that human beings and animals have a sense of being stared at. This is what he called it, the sense of being stared at. You guys ever experienced this? Yes. Mm -hmm. You just feel like someone's watching you and you turn, and someone's watching you. Yes. It happens yeah. all the time, <laughs> honestly. Feeling it now, yeah. yeah. We're on TV, mm -hmm. though. Mm. Uh, so... <laughs> Tearing back, I don't know. The how TV works? Somehow... We know when someone is looking at us, even though we have our back turned or our attention is focused in another direction. We can just feel it. Mm -hmm. None of our physical senses, though, are telling us, right? Your eyes aren't facing that person. You're not hearing them. You just feel that they're watching you. In laboratory conditions, using special goggles, this guy, Colin Andrew Ross, proved the existence of what he called, stay with me now, ocular extra mission. Hmm. What? I have no that idea what it's about. Not the name I would have chosen. What yeah. does that even mean? <laughs> that suggests like nothing. 
The eyes emit an electromagnetic energy oh. that Ooh. scientific instruments are able to detect. This has some interesting implications for where belief in the evil eye is strongest. Is like x-ray vision or like heat rays coming out of your eyes? Yeah, like it's Superman. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like Superman. Balls in somebody's ness. I'm going to work on that after this. Okay. Okay. Ross believes huh. it's possible that proximity to geographic regions with stronger natural electromagnetic radiation might cause certain groups to have stronger belief or functionality of the evil eye. What are you guys doing back there? We're she got testing me. the theory. She got me with it. I, I sensed it. You sensed it? You did. Sense it? Yep. The many electrical and magnetic signals in the modern Western world, by contrast, could dilute the power of ocular extra mission. So in other words, oh, in, we're at places where you believe in the evil eye, there's like extra electromagnetic energy in the earth. It's like feeding your evil eye powers. Are you still Jacob messing around? Jacob won't stop looking at me. I wasn't that time. I was. He's trying to you curse her. <laughs> Jacob's trying to no, curse me. No, I was trying to listen to you. We are so you. close to finishing this. I was trying this. to listen to you and you mm. moved out of the way and we made eye contact. That was all. For Moving Emily. on. For Emily Williams Kelly. Hex death, or the evil eye, is just one of many phenomena that prove a holistic unity between mind and body. As we discussed in our episode on mindless zombies and thinking fruit, the third episode of our soul series, there's a strong tradi- What? There's a strong tradi- <laughs> Did you say- you said something. I said, yes. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for your valuable contribution. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Yes, that is yes. a good one. That's a good one. There's a strong tradition in the Western world <laughs> that convinces us that our minds and bodies are separate. In fact, they are deeply united. What we believe and how we think has a profound influence on our health. This can lead to some dangerous territory, like blaming sick people for their illness because they aren't positive thinking enough. Hmm. That was very sassy. Well, because it's nonsense. It's true that stress makes illness worse, and good feelings can make the body function better. But feelings alone, except in very extreme and unusual cases, cannot prevent serious illness or cure serious illness. We'll save questions of faith healing for another series. Today we're talking about faith killing. <laughs> the question stands, is the evil eye real? To bring this on home. We're, we're coming home now. We're bringing this home. Is the evil eye real? Can one person curse another person? To die. Yes. That sounds pretty real to me. To answer this question uh, in modern terms. <laughs> he wasn't asking us. No, 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 I really don't care. I was just taking there. a dramatic pause. You did look at all of us. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't care what you thought. I thought that was evident you in were my giving eyes. All of us you heard it here. Eye. Rob doesn't care what we think. <laughs> I just inexplicably invite you to tell everyone your thoughts. Yep. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Well, now they know the answer. <laughs> to answer, but to, well, so, to bring the evil eye home. <laughs> To the modern listener and the viewer, um, let's talk about something that I do in one of my courses. Uh, I do an exercise with my students where I ask what they feel like when they fail a test. Uh, but you know, many of our listeners are not in college anymore, uh, so I want to change the terms around to fit our wider audience at their different stages of life. Suppose, and this should all of us should be able to feel this one. Suppose you woke up tomorrow morning and went to check your bank account. Uh, and that bank account had, let's say, five thousand dollars in it, or maybe fifteen thousand dollars in it, or, uh, yeah. or like fifty dollars. <laughs> a good day, actually. Yeah. Twenty. <laughs> and when you went to check it, it was completely empty. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. But it, it, but you just had five thousand dollars the day before, mm. and now you've gone oh. to check, and having spent none of it, it's I was gone. probably I dreaming when the five thousand yeah. dollars was in it. I woke up I'm like, oh, this is just my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, if such a thing happened to you, how would you how would you feel? Well, I mean, <laughs> if I had five thousand uh, dollars, I will gladly take donations. Um, Patreon. Patreon for me alone. <laughs> but if I lost it, like my heart would be like racing and stuff like that. Yeah. I probably would like feel sick about it. Like maybe like I would vomit. Yeah, it makes you physically ill. I feel like that's exactly. How it. You feel physically ill. <laughs> you have an extreme stress response to numbers. On a screen. Numbers do scare me. Yep. Or a bank book, if you still do that kind of thing. <laughs> um, does anybody have a bank book? Every day I go books? to my desk and open it You're up open and it, you pencil it. in the zero dollars that I have. <clears throat> but we love all of our listeners who do. Uh, 
Oh, but what you're looking at is just numbers. Money isn't even a physical thing anymore. Think about how much of your own money you've even ever seen, like your actual money. We don't see our money. My number goes up or it goes down as somebody else passes their numbers to me, right? That's really how money works. It's just numbers moving. Mm. <laughs> Losing my numbers precipitates the same response our caveman ancestors and cavewoman ancestors might have had in discovering a rattlesnake in their path. <laughs> Right? Yeah. That's really funny to think about. Oh no, my numbers! Rather than, I'm going to die. <laughs> but we, f we do the same thing. Our bodies respond in the exact same way. Uh, uh, rattlesnakes can kill you. Numbers cannot. Yeah, but in a way they can, because yeah. you have to use those numbers to buy food, put a roof over our heads, like wear clothes. All of it costs money. Well, this was free. This was handed to me. But, you know... On the street? <laughs> I, I mucked some money to get this. <laughs> We're going to put you on the Queen Anne's County Sheriff's uh, Wheel of Crime. Which is a thing here in Queen Anne's County. <laughs> <laughs> Excited. Um, it's weird. <laughs> we can see it. We're really recording cool. right next to it. Yeah. Um, buying food at the grocery store and owning a piece of land that isn't really yours. Uh, because ownership itself is a social fiction, a contract we'd made up, right? That yep. squirrels and owls and cave people cannot even begin to understand, <laughs> let alone honor. Uh, that's, that's what the numbers are all about, right? Mm -hmm. Couldn't you just as easily make a roof with some leaves and some sticks? Well, yeah. I'm sure someone would have to show me, but once, yeah, uh, once that... I think but if you why weren't you doing idea. that all along? Why weren't you learning how to build a shelter out of logs and mud? Couldn't you grow your own food or catch it in the stream? Why, why haven't you been learning this? Why are you learning these ridiculous occult things? Well, you should have been learning these practical things. As an actor, I'm starting to. <laughs> why did you bother learning how to type or to change a tire when you could have been learning these basic survival skills? If you had these skills, what would you need any of the numbers for? What would they matter? How could they hurt you? Um. <laughs> yeah, you got, well, I'm you rethinking my life path a little bit. The numbers can give us physical pain because we collectively as a species, or as a social group, give them power and meaning. They're just a social fact. The same way Mr. Vanders gave the voodoo doctor power, and Mr. X gave his mother power. The systems and the people... Okay, so we just have to talk about what's happening. Uh, <laughs> Somebody was So our new captain of the there. table, uh, James, uh, is mic'd currently, and, uh, and he had to cough. So he's, he had he's to. been standing in the corner like this, <laughs> like Dracula, <laughs> I think trying to hold back the cough. I've never seen this. I was waiting for him to just fly away. Yeah, he's, he's got he's his arms cool. up over his head. This is... He's innovative. Okay. <laughs> he's making do. <laughs> Where were we? As I was saying, the systems and people we give power to have the power to profoundly influence our mental and physical well-being. Because we endow these numbers, the, the life path of learning about math and history and engineering. Mm. Who does that? Right? These things are what we have, rather than learning survival skills. Because we say this is what's important and gathering numbers is what's important and having numbers is how you eat. Right? But you yeah. can just go fishing. This is what makes uh, our, so this is what gives all these cultural fake things, these numbers on a screen, all their power. The act of giving power or investing meaning happens deep inside ourselves. We don't consciously decide to buy into the American dream of the house and the two trips a week to Whole Foods and the two and a half children <laughs> and the sport utility half, vehicle. Two and a half like children? A With the individual screens for every bucket seat in your sport utility vehicle so your kids are occupied. The act of buying in to this whole dream happens without us knowing we're doing it. We're sort of born into this. And it takes great effort, great occult power to break that bond when it's hurting us. When our mother or father or sibling or lover is poisoning our life, or when the values of our culture, the materialism, the egotism, the capitalism, the medical industrial complex aren't serving us, but making us miserable. If the evil eye shows us the danger of investing belief in any single system or person, it also shows how healthy it can be to have alternative options, other ways to believe, new questions to break old patterns of believing. That, in many ways, is why I podcast the occult. 
For me, the occult is a never-ending quest for new ways of defining our existence, and a good occultist is never satisfied with anything like a final answer, a final system, a final belief that can, when we least expect it, betray and murder us. Olivia? Oh, are we adjourning? Oh. I think that was a high note. Yeah. Bring us okay. on home. I hereby adjourn and declare closed the secret meeting of the El Cam. It's not a it's not a secret Chemical. meeting. We're we're on TV I think right it's now. Kind of, Everyone, but they, they, like, they do know where we are. It's gonna be on YouTube. <laughs> I've told them exactly where to find us. If you uh, contribute to our Patreon, then you get into our secret meeting. I hereby adjourn and declare <laughs> close to this meeting of the secret order of alchemical actors. We're the secret. Yeah. Until such a time as we get together and do it again. We've been joined uh, today by Olivia. That's me. Shannon. Bye. James Kaplangis, our captain of the table. Oh, goodbye. <laughs> oh, Jacob Wheatley. Fare thee well. Savannah Verrett. <laughs> Goodbye. And uh, the actors for today uh, have included Lucy Bond, Morgan Jung, uh, Ray Candela, Johnny Cook, and Brandon Walls. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say bye. Who are not in the room because we're talking about them like we always do when they're not in the room. Cool. It's <laughs> <That was> weird. <laughs> Uh, we encourage you, as always, to find us on Facebook. Um, Instagram. Instagram, yes, Shannon, we got that Instagram page. And Twitter. Tweet at it and with us. Tell your friends, visit us on <laughs> Patreon. We uh, look forward to seeing you our, for our next episode in which we will discuss human sacrifice. Ah, uh, yes. yes, the occult dimensions of human sacrifice. Ooh. Until next time, nice. my name is Rob, and this is Occult Confessions. <laughs>